Cool. Okay, so it's uh, six fifty here in Brisbane, and for the next hour we'll be uh, finishing Unit Four, but we'll start with the set cover problem. And um, yeah, so that that is a something that I owe you guys from uh, the application of uh, of Unit Two of sets. Okay, so just want us to discuss this problem a bit and then get, get a feel for it. And we'll also speak about uh, mathematical programming problems. This is mathematical programming optimization problems and things like that. So we, we have the full language to understand this problem. Let's see what's it about. So if you have a set of elements, those elements are one to N, this little N can be quite big, maybe a thousand or 2000 or maybe just 10 or something like that. Those elements you can call them the universe. So some finite set, okay. And you have a collection S, which is a collection of M sets, okay? And those sets, if you take the union of all the sets, then they actually cover the universe, okay? So here, for example, look, um, your universe can be, if the universe was one, two, three, four, five, little n is five. And say you have a collection of sets, what is little m? What is little m? How many sets? What is little m in this specific collection? How many sets do you see here? What's the cardinality of, of s of the collection of sets? Maybe you don't want to answer questions anymore. Four. Okay, thank you. Somebody wants to. Okay, so you've got four sets, right? And their union, if you do the union of one, two, three, and two, four, and three, four, and four, five, you can cover. You, you did the union, you covered. So that's it. this is the data of the problem. So simple, okay? You just have the universe. And you have a collection of sets that you know that if you took all of them together, you'll cover things. Okay. Now, the set cover problem is can you find a subset, C, a subset of S? You see, so S is a set of sets, and C is also going to be a set of sets, such that the union of C covers the universe, but it's the minimal one, the minimal one. Okay, let's solve the set cover problem. Let's, let's solve the set cover problem for this data that you see here, just in Wikipedia. We're just looking at Wikipedia. What's, uh, let's find some subsets of S that cover U, whose union is U. Let's see, uh, one, two, three, inter union two, four doesn't work, but somebody suggested, Zhao suggested one, two, three, four, five. That looks to me pretty good. Okay, so I think that is a solution. There might be other subsets of S but, uh, that do that, but we cannot get a subset of S of size one, right? So there is not a single set in S that covers you. Uh, so that suggestion of the sets one, two, three, sorry, of the set one, two, three union, the set four, five covers the universe. All right, it sounds so simple. Okay, that's, that's a set cover problem. However, this problem, I, by the way, is simple, but keep in mind, now you speak about sets, so you can see that a set here has subsets as its elements. You can speak about those things. You see that the language here uses the exact same precision that you've used for speaking about sets, etc. Now, it turns out that this is one of the uh, classic 21 NP-complete problems. Uh, somebody surely has heard of NP-complete. Uh, anybody heard of NP-complete problems, NP-hard problems? Somebody that has done some computer science. NP completeness, NP hardness, somebody. We've got some yeps, we've got some yeps, but I'm sure there's some no's, right? Some no's, somebody has not heard about NP. Okay, good. All right. So in general, when you're given kind of a problem and you know this is a problem that you could formulate, hey, let's find an algorithm for finding this problem. You might say, hey, how fast can this algorithm run? Do I have an efficient algorithm, yes or no? Okay. Now, there's a family of many, many problems, and they're called the NP-complete problems, for which it is believed that you do not have any algorithm that runs computationally fast. So they're believed to be difficult computational problems. Now, by computationally fast, you can drill into this and you can see the mathematics of it a bit more. We won't do it fully, but by computationally fast, what we mean is that the running time of the algorithm would be an order of a polynomial of the input size of the number of sets in this case of n, that it won't grow exponentially. That'll be just an order of a polynomial, okay? 
Yes. Is it related to time complexity? Yes. So it, for example, if you're given numbers one to N, uh, how fast can any R, sorry, sorry, not numbers. So if I give you a list of N elements of N numbers, they're not one to N, they're just N numbers. How long does it take you to sort them in terms of N? Does anybody know? I mean, you, you, sh you would only know if you've done a bit of computer science. Uh, if, I, if I give you, okay, so Trove said O of N log N, right. You actually cannot do better than that. Right now, that capital O means that it's a function. Well, of course, if you have a faster computer that's twice as fast, it'll maybe run twice as fast, but it's only a constant relative to this n log n. n log n is just a bit more than n. Okay. Uh, quick sort actually will only do it in average time complexity n log n. Heap sort and merge sort will do it in O n log n for any input, but quick sort is quick for, because it's not always a complexity that matters. Okay. So, Blah, 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 blah. I'm speaking all over around. Um, and is it different for various sort algorithms? Yes, for sure. Because a simple sorting algorithm that you would just think of yourself would, deal, would be an order of n squared, for example. Okay. Now back to a problem like the set cover problem. Can somebody give me a naive algorithm? Don't worry about time complexity for solving the set cover problem. How would you solve? I mean, uh, we had Zhao solve this simple example of the set cover problem, but how would you how would you do it algorithmically and use the language that you've studied hard for the power set things like that? What what? How would you just give the naive? There's sometimes what you call the naive or brute force algorithm for solving the set cover problem. So I'm given these M sets and I want to pick some collection of them, which is as small as possible. And that collection should have a union that's the whole universe. How would you do that? Maybe it's hard to write in words. So let me, does anybody want to open the mic and explain just roughly hey, what we would do? Okay, you guys did have a quiz. That's fair enough. Tired. But some of you are just in the middle of the day. Here in Brisbane, we're in seven in the evening. Okay, so what you will do, here is, here is a naive way, is let's try and solve it for only a single set. So see, does this single set cover? No. 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 Then let's go to... Uh, sets of uh, to two sets. So we'll try the pair one, two, three, and two, four. Does that cover? No, the union of one, two, three, and two, four does not cover because it's not one, two, three, four, five. How about one, two, three, and three, four? No. How about one, two, three, and four, five? Yes, that's a cover. Okay. And that's a minimal cover because we started and we're done. Okay. Now, in general, how many collection of subsets do we need? So I see max time O n squared, but I'm not sure. How many, what were we actually doing? So think of the power set now. What, how many, what's the worst time complexity that this algorithm has? Think of the, what's the size of the power set of S? What's the size of the power set of S? 16, right? So we need to try two to the M we need to try two to the M unions, okay? So it's not N squared, it's two to the M, okay? So what we'll need to try with this algorithm in general, we'll need to try all possible combinations of subsets until we succeed. So in general, it's gonna take a very long time. Now, it is often that for a problem here, I also have, look, listen to, I have a very bad sorting algorithm. Give me n numbers, give me n numbers. I'm now jumping to sort. Give me n numbers. I'm gonna try all n factorial permutations until I get a sorted permutation. You know what this is called? This is called the world's most horrible, stupid sorting algorithm, but it's, it works. At least, you know, you, it's, it's well-defined, right? I can try all possible, com I mean, that algorithm takes about n force. So it's brute force, it's not good. But for sorting, you know that you can do better. People said above, hey, you can do different ways. You can do quick sort, bubble sort, merge sort, heap sort, blah, blah sort, okay? 
for a problem like the set cover, it is mathematically shown that we, well, it is almost, I'll explain. It is almost mathematically shown that you cannot do better than something that takes exponential time. By the way, it's not true what's being written in the chat n, n cubed, it's not n cubed. Oh, so yeah, in this, in three subsets, but in general, you know, you have m subsets. So as a function of m, as a function of m, I'm writing in the chat, you'll, you'll take two to the power m or O of two to the power m because you need to try all possible subsets okay now the set cover problem actually does not have a solution that is better than that so in a sense it's a it's a negative result it's kind of something bad and this theory of np completeness that you could look at later etc actually shows that if you could solve the set cover problem in a an efficient way that's not exponentially big, like O2 to the N. Then you can solve many, many other problems that are very popular. SAT problem, Hamiltonian cycle problem, three coloring problem, integer programming problem, traveling salesman problem. They will all be related to the set cover problem. So you could, you could pose one problem in the language of a different problem. Okay, now it's an open question the p versus np question that's uh is an open question if somebody it cut yeah it's an np complete problem so if somebody and is able to show that the set of uh, p equals the set np or is proved not they'll win a million dollars because it's one of the millennial million dollar problems and the set cover problem is one of those problems that lie in the complexity class of the np complete problems okay uh, the reason I'm speaking about it here is, well, it's simple. It's simple, but it actually has applications. So we're not going to look at it all, but you can formulate this problem, for example, as what's called an integer linear programming problem. So if any of you will do later a course in operations research during your degree in Master of Data Science, then you'll, you'll deal with such problems. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I just want to show a bit of a Mathematica notebook that just kind of plays with the set problem. It doesn't explore it fully, but just to just to get a, a bit more of a feel for it. Um, I'll just open the whole desktop. No, oops, that's not what we wanted. Um, and um, here is Mathematica. Okay, this might be a bit small. Let me increase the size. Okay, so we'll just play a bit with a set cover problem. And again, this is a problem that does not have an efficient solution. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to set the seed uh, as a random seed. And let's get uh, n is, that little n is the number of elements in our universe. So our universe is a set, is a range, one, two, three, four, five, two, up to 10. Okay, now what I'm going to do here, I'm just setting the seed so that this will be reproducible, okay? I'll stop me and ask questions if not clear. Um, let's make this a bit bigger. So it's just like that. Okay. Now, um, here, what we're going to do is we're going to use a random sample function. And we're going to take, the, we can use the subsets function of, of the universe of size three. So, when you do this subsets of size three, let's just look at the help of subsets. Okay. Subsets like that gives all subsets containing uh, exactly three elements and subsets like that when the N is not in listing brackets containing at most three elements. Okay. So we're going to get, I'm just creating an instance of the problem. Okay. And in real application, um, and there are a few real applications dealing with uh, passwords and things like that. They're just a bit more complicated to explain. Of course, you'll get your instance. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a, an instance of 10 sets. Okay. So here uh, on right, this is like M equals 10, you know, subsets. So at this point, this is the data. This is really the data of the set cover problem. This and the fact that my universe is this, right? So U and S are my data. Uh, if you want to see the data in table form, here it is. 
you got the set six, seven, nine, the set eight, which is just a singleton, the set one, seven, ten, the set one, five, etc. Okay, uh, let's just see that this is that this data is actually valid for the set cover problem. We want to be able. I mean, it won't be valid if if the union of all of these is not the whole thing. So if if I now do union, apply union on SS, I get everything. Okay. Check the universe is covered by my subsets. Okay. Now comes the question, what is a minimal collection of subsets? And it's not so not immediately clear already when you look at, at this data, right? So what is a minimal collection of subsets that will solve the set cover problem? Okay. Uh, by the way, you can do complement of if if you are not sure if all the numbers are here. Of course, you can do uh, the length of this, but you can do the complement of u u union sets, and you get nothing, right? So that shows me that the union of this is the same. Um, now look, I can now take uh, subsets of S S, and this look, look what subsets does. So look, if I just do the subsets of the of A B C. What is this? How would you now we have a we have a name for this in our language? What do you call? What does this do? What did I just do? Subsets of the set ABC. It's a power set, right? That's how I create the power set. Okay. Now I'm going to I'm going for the brute force algorithm, and it's actually even brute force in the sense of it's very horrible in terms of memory. So it uses full memory as well. The memory complexity is always bad, also bad. But M here is just 10, so it's going to be solvable. If M was 100, that's it. The computer will get stuck. Okay, or even if m is 20 or 30. Okay, so um, now I'll do SS2 is going to be all of the possible subsets. And as you won't be surprised at this point, the length of SS2 is 1024. Why is the length of SS2 1024? Well, because we've got 10 sets, right? Yes. Now, each one, each, let's, let's take, for example, here is some arbitrary SS2, uh, 874. This is one collection of subsets. Okay, this is one collection of subsets. 6798, da, 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 da. If we do SS2, one, this is, you know, the first subset. When we do subsets, it actually gives us the subsets in a bit of an organized manner. It first gives us the sets of size zero, and it gives us the sets of size one, the singleton, and the sets of size two. So I did the same here. So if I went to some arbitrary, you know, SS2 351, this is potentially a candidate that is a set cover. Now, what do I want to do? I want to find a minimal set cover, right? So here's here's one way of one way of doing it. So, and I'm, I'm not I'm not going to do it all the way, but but um, but let's um, let's see. So we've got the um, we'll do the table on uh, applying the union on SS2I to check if the length of the union this checks. So uh, let me just show you this. So if I if I do this, for example, let's try the sixty six subset. Is the union of the 66 uh, element. So this thing I'm doing here, ta, 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 like that. Okay, the 66 collection of subsets. Is the length of that equal to 10? False. So that's not a set cover. How about, you know, the 244th? False. How about the 874th? Oh, false. How about, let's try the last one, the 1024. I'm quite sure it will be true. Okay, because that's a subset that contains everything. How about the 1022? That's also true, right? So what I can do now is I can run, for example, I'm gonna try the solutions, the 800 subsets until the 820 subsets. It's collection of subsets of the subsets. Okay, that's the potential solutions. And you see that some of them are true, some are false, some are true, some are false, etc. right? So let's now try together. I haven't done this, but let's actually try and find which is the minimal, which one of these is a minimal uh, set cover. Okay, so how do we do this? Does, let's, 
let's ma let's maybe do it in a let's use a do loop okay let's let's use a do loop okay you'll have more mathematical exercises um let's do a do loop so um we, we, or or you know what let's use a for loop what do you want for loop or do loop for loop looks messy what do you want do loop do for while many different ways of doing it some functional programming let's go for something else. do for a while so, okay we, we don't we don't have full full consistency but okay let, let's let's do a do okay um do is do is kind of you know if i do do uh, print pi and then print by and then uh, i do that let's put a comma three times it's a simple thing it repeats high by high by high by so you know our world is kind of simple in this case so let's just stick with do okay so and let's 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 do it in a very messy manner but that's okay so we'll call i i i is like the set in, in the initial index okay so that is the uh subset or element of ss2 index okay and we're just going to do this for 1024 times okay so each time we're going to do i i at the end of the day we're going to do i i equals i i plus one okay like an increment okay so now we can write our stuff here so what we want to do is we want to say if length i'll just copy this if the length of the union equals 10 apply union s of i let's just do print found cover I mean, this is not the final thing okay print found cover close the if perhaps like this i think this should work so check my programs tell me if you think that should will this go and let's let's first of all just do this just for uh, the i going one to ten okay so i starts at one so when I say the program, the program is this cell, right? Program is a cell. So I starts at one and we do, if we have a cover, um, then e, yes, it's not, maybe it's a correction. Thanks, so somebody corrected. It's not I, but I, I, good. Okay, now, by the way, this is one of the annoying things that would happen in Mathematica. This depending, well, depending, sometimes it will work, sometimes not. I think this specific thing won't work, but sometimes you just will have a false and it won't do anything, but yeah. So it won't throw a syntax error, but yes, good catch. Okay, so we're gonna say, if we have a set cover, you know, it's if we have a set cover, uh, then tell the world. Let's see. Oh, okay, there wasn't a set cover on the first 10. But of course, if and and now remember, there isn't a set cover on the first 10. Because the way we created these subsets, these are first only subsets of set covers of size one, etc. Two, but we can actually use this to our advantage. Look, if I do, if I do, let, let me do here map of length on SS two, you guys know what the map function does? Who, who doesn't know? Does somebody not know what map does? If not, then we'll see. Okay. Map, maybe yes, no. So look, if I, I can map, okay, IDK, which is, I don't know for young people. All right. So if I do map of the function F on ABC, it simply applies F of A, F of B, F of C. Okay. That's what it does. So it's kind of a, a, a very basic construct of functional programming, right? Now you take a function, you can apply to elements of a list. That's what map does. Okay, it, it exists in other languages as well. All right, so that's map. So if I map length on SS2, look, I'm gonna get this list of zeros, all the subsets of size zero, all the subsets of size one, how many twos do I see here, by the way? You guys can relate this to your combinatorics. How many, how many twos am I seeing here? Rough, don't tell me numerically, tell me in terms of some sort of combinatorical thing. How many twos am I seeing? 10 over two, exactly. And how many threes am I seeing? 10 over three, 
et cetera, et cetera, right? Because this is a subset. Now let's use this to our advantage because what we're gonna do is the, we're gonna try and see, does this thing cover? Oh no, it's not gonna cover. Does this thing cover? No, these things are not gonna cover because you know our subsets, none of them is a, is a full set, right? Otherwise, if you put the full set in the set cover problem, you're kind of done, okay? Does this one cover? Maybe yes, maybe no. Does this one cover? Maybe yes, maybe no. So the minute we find a cover, we know it's a minimal set cover. Do you understand? Because we're actually running over subsets and in increasing size as a consequence of how the subsets, the power set function, organize these sets. Now, I remind you, mathematically, a set is not an ordered collection. But in Mathematica, this thing is not a set. It's actually a list of lists. OK, so there is some order. OK, I hope all those nuances are clear. Stop me if not. So. Before, okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to say, oh, run it, see if we found the cover. Let's go on the first hundred. Did we find cover? No. So let's just do the whole thing, the whole bloody 1024. I think we'll see a few print of found covers. Let's see. Oh, okay. We found some covers, quite a lot of covers. Which one from those prints is a minimal set cover? The first one, right? It's the first one because by the way that we're running over the sets. So instead of doing that, let me now version 2.0 of our program. Let's comment this out. We don't want to say fun cover. We do if that, then break. Is there a break? I don't know. I don't know Mathematica. Let's see. Break. Yeah. X is the nearest enclosing do loop. Thank you. OK, so let's do a break. OK. But before we do a break, uh, wait, that's in the if we do a break, we said, uh, we said uh, best, we say minimal cover, uh, minimal cover equals, uh, let's start it as negative one, like not like some undefined, whatever. And now we'll do minimal cover equals SS2 I. -I. So, and then at the end, we can say here, minimal cover. Okay. So we're just starting this variable. It's like a negative one. And then here it, it's, it's record a minimal cover. Why did I choose to say a and not the minimal cover? Why did I say a and not the minimal cover? Not the only one, potentially not the only one. Mathematicians, extremely touchy people about I and the. When you say the minimal cover, it means that it is a minimal cover and it's a unique minimum, but a minimal cover, well, maybe there are others. It's actually not clear if it's the only one or not, but it's potentially not the only one. We could check for that, but we won't do it here. Let's let it run. Minimal cover, that was impressive. It wrote the text minimal cover. Why? Because we have a typo and a to do this. Let's let it run again. We got it. This is a minimal cover. Let's do the union of the minimal cover. Uh, oh, no. So, yeah. Okay. So, union, the way to do this is to apply apply union to minimal cover because, because union that apply union to minimal cover would it's like union of the first element and the second element, and the third element, and the fourth element of minimal cover. Like it splats the elements of minimal cover into the union. Let's do that. Is this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Let's do length of minimal cover. Congratulations, we have solved a set cover problem instance. It might seem easy, but if you want to mess things up a bit, just increase the number of subsets here. You need to increase your universe size as well. And the theory of computer science will actually show that unless P equals NP, which is something that people believe is not true, then you cannot solve this in a much, much better way. There are, if you go to the Wikipedia page, you can, and you could read about it elsewhere, there are what's called greedy algorithms. So there are heuristics 
that don't necessarily find the minimal cover, but find some sort of a, an approximate cover. And there's even some analysis for them. And it's nice you're seeing this here because next week you're gonna do with Tim, you're gonna start to work on series. So this, is, uh, these, um, this sequence goes and becomes the harmonic series. Okay. Um, but anyway, so there's more to this obviously, but the purpose was just so we kind of use the language of sets that you now know well to, to deal with it. Other questions about this set cover thing? No? Ready to move on? Okay, 30 more minutes of lecture. Hang in there. Now we're going to kind of a bit more learning. Okay, I'll put this, this will be in the, in the GitHub repo. Okay, let's stop the share. And go to this share. <clears throat> okay. So there's just a few more, I have a bit of a debt to you guys. We, we stopped exactly here when we got to functions, right? And today we're going to finish that. I'm, I'm gonna go rather kind of, I'll just, just touch the highlights um, of, of the things we need um, and that's it. So we stopped, we stopped at relations and you even had just a bit of relations in, in your quiz, okay? Uh, and a function is a relation uh, that uh, where the for every instance of the first element, you only have a single, you you have a unique instance of the second element. Okay, so for all x and a, there is a y and b such that x y is in the relation, and for all x and a, uh, and if y z is in b, then if x y is in f and x z is in b, then y equals z. So you can't have this type of thing where um, for one point in the domain, you have two things in the range, roughly. Yeah, that's, that's it. Um, now you can, all, you can also define a, an inverse, and that's a function and that's all, that's anything that's a function in your world is that. I'm not talking about computer functions unless they're pure computer functions, but mathematical functions, that's what they do. They have an A and they have a B. And then there's a notation for that, which you'll see throughout your data science career uh, in one way or another, because data scientists fit functions all the time. For those of you that were uh, with me in the introduction to data science lecture today, uh, yeah, the, that's kind of machine learning is all about finding a function from the domain to the range. Okay, so you're actually trying to find this function. Okay, or and that function will be some sort of model. Okay, so um, if you have a binary relation, then you can also speak about the inverse relation, and it's just that. Uh, it's just a relation that just flips the y and the x, okay? So the inverse relation is all of the y and x that are, notice that we flip the b and the a such that x, y are, are in r, okay? So there is an inverse relation, okay? There's also a notation for something that we call, so just a bit of language, we can call a binary relation on a set uh, is just a binary relation on, on A times itself. So sometimes you'll say a binary relation on the real numbers, right? And that mean, just means you put the real numbers here and the real numbers here, for example. Okay, I'm, I'm going forward quickly because we, I just wanna get to the kind of a few core things and, and that's it. So we're just touching a few, a few topics. Um, <clears throat> binary relations can have properties and uh, there are three kind of important properties, reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity, okay? So let's see what those properties are and the combination of these three actually means something. So, and, and we'll get to that too. Okay, so the relation is reflexive if X is related to X, okay? By the way, we, we're kind of pausing with functions for a second and we'll get back to functions. So functions were a specific type of relation, but now we're back a second. We're just looking at relations, okay? So if X is related to X, right? So that means that X comma X is in the relation, 
right? And the relation, remember, is a subset of, uh, of, of A and A. I mean, it's a binary relation. So we don't have two sets, okay? It's symmetric if um, whenever X is related to Y, then Y is related to X, okay? That makes it symmetric. And it's transitive, so the transitivity property means that if X is related to Y and Y is related to Z, then X is related to Z. So transitivity note, you've got the Y here and transitivity means that you've got, whoops, I'm sorry, that you, that if these two things hold, which you see here, if these two things hold, then X is related to Z, okay? That's a binary relation that has this property is called transitivity, a transitive property. So a, rela a binary relation that has those three properties is actually called an equivalence relation. Now there's a table here and you can spend a bit of time, don't worry about anti-symmetric right now, but reflexive, symmetric and transitive, okay? So you can draw relations via a graph and you can say a re re reflexive A is related to A, it's symmetric if A, if whenever this holds, this holds, and it's transitive if this, uh, if um, A points to B and B points to C. Um, no, what am I saying? It's, well, okay, I don't, don't wanna ignore this illustration, but, uh, because I don't know how to read it, but, in terms of transitive, but it's simply transitive of like we said, if A R B and B R C, then A R C. Okay. Yeah. Now, the importance of these three properties, reflexivity, symmetric relation, and transitive relation, is that a relation that I'm, I'm skipping more forward is the following. So, a relation that satisfies um, all of these things is an equivalence relation, okay? So, and so if you have a relation on a set that's reflexive, transitive, and symmetric, then you have an equivalence relation, okay? We're, we're only touching this kind of at the tip of the iceberg, but it's, it's just so you see these concepts and that's it. Um, so let's, let's discuss this. So, Recall that a partition of a set, what's a partition of a set? So you have some, some big set X. A partition is a collection of subsets such that their union is the whole set, okay? The union of A, B, C, D, E, F, etc., is the whole set. And they're also disjoint, okay? That's a partition, okay? Now, the thing is that when you have a partition that, that, and we do this all the time because you know, when, when we think of data, we partition data into disjoint sets and cover everything, okay? So when you have a partition, that partition immediately induces a binary relation. By, by way induces, I mean, there is a relation that comes from this partition, okay? So let's see the relation. The relation is, X is related to Y if they're both in the same subset, okay? So if I put two points here, the two red points are related. But if I put, let's say, this um, blue point here and this purple point here, these two points are not related, okay? There's no relation between these two points according to this relation because the relation kind of says, if you guys are in the same subset, you're related, okay? Very natural, you can take the country, divide it. If you're in the same subset, you're related. Now, it's not hard to see that this relation is actually, um, this, this specific relation that we said, this binary relation induced by this partition, that this binary relation is actually a um, symmetric, because you know, if this is in the same subset and this and this in the same subset of this, it's not hard to see that it's reflexive. 
Well, this is certainly in the same subset of itself. And it's not hard to see that it's transitive because if this is in the same subset of this and this is in the same subset of this, then this is in the same subset of this, okay? It all comes from basic logic. So this, this binary relation is transitive, okay? And here's a theorem that given a partition of a set and a binary relation induced by the partition, R is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Now, the reverse works as well. And this is kind of a nice thing. So if you give me a relation that's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, then you're actually creating a partition. Okay, so if you take a set and you find a relation that's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, then you're actually creating a partition. Such a relation is called an equivalence relation, and that appears in multiple places in mathematics. I'm going fast, and, uh, and you guys are tired after a quiz. I hope that some of this is making sense. Uh, we're, not, we're not digging into, into it too much, okay? Now, when you speak about equivalence relation, you can also speak about an equivalence class and uh, you denote it like this, but we won't, we just won't dwell on it because we don't have time. But this is here, you stick in some element and you stick the relation. So this, these are all of the elements of the set that are equivalent to all the X in, in, in the whole set that are equivalent to this element, okay? You need to see some examples and there's often examples in number theory and they're here, but we just don't have time, time for that. Okay, so I, the, the, point, the point from this is you've got the notion of relation. We left for a second the notion of functions. We're coming to him back. We delved into uh, this thing called equivalence relations, which is um, essentially, it's not essentially, it's, it's mathematically having an equivalence relation is just like having a partition and having a partition is just like having an equivalence relation. And that might appear for you at some point. Um, there are a few more definitions here, like total order relation, et cetera, but we won't worry about that, okay? And that, that closes what we want to say on relations. Okay. No complaints. Anybody want to complain? Complaining is allowed. No. Still awake. Still awake is good. Awake and alive. I guess awake implies alive. All right. That's good. Uh, not the other way. All right, so now we are getting into functions. And uh, people, this is where the rest of your course is going to be pretty much, with the exception of a bit of sequences. Um, yeah, so then the question, there's examples. You, you There's no, uh, in some of the video, what you, the question is where you can find the answer to some of these examples. In some of the videos that are on the website, you'll see because there are video recordings where I spoke about this a few years ago, you'll see some of the answers. Uh, you can also ask me in the consultation hour and such. Uh, these are, this content that I'm skipping, I'm skipping, but it's also not stuff you're gonna be assessed on, okay? So, but if you do take a bit more time to read and wanna work on it, and that's good, then please discuss with me in the consultation hour your solutions if you'd like, or discuss with others in Piazza. Okay, functions. So we mentioned function, that a function is a specific type of relation, right? Now it turns out that this is kind of like one of the most important things in mathematics, a function. Okay, and here's some discussion, Leibniz, yada, 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 functions, 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 okay? Now, a synonym for a function is sometimes a map or a mapping, okay? And here's a, we see again, a definition of a function. So a binary relation, uh, from a set X to a set Y. So this is now a relation from set Y to set uh, X to Y. It is a function. I'm just defining, we, we saw a definition for function before. It's the same definition, but we're now writing it just a bit different. If for all X in, sorry, if for all X in this calligraphic X, there is a unique Y that X and Y is in this relation, okay? So for every X, there is exactly one element of Y. By the way, it's not that for every Y, you need to have exactly one element of X. We'll get to that in a second, okay? And sometimes you can call this thing well-defined, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, 
So let's let's uh, now touch the main definitions of a function. Okay, and these are things you would have seen before, but we're just formalizing them a bit more. So I have now a function from this calligraphic x to the calligraphic y. This thing is a function. Let's do some coloring in. Here's an x and here's a y. Okay, so this set x is called the domain. And the function must be defined. If, if you have some little x, which is in this x, you must tell me what is f of x. It must be defined there, okay? And this y, sometimes in slang, what do people call this y in slang? Well, something starting with r. I'll explain why slang in a second. But what, what would you have called this y? Domain and you, you've done this, some of you in, in, in a different place, maybe not in English. Domain and range, okay? But you don't call y the range, you call it the codomain, called the codomain. So the function goes from here to here. And the definition of the function is not just how the function works, it's also what the domain and the codomain is. I'll, I'll explain in a second, okay? So for each x in the domain, there is a single unique element of the codomain and we call that f of x, okay? That's a function of f of x. By the way, sometimes you, this arrow, you write it, look at this. Here there is no, you know, no line and here there is a line, right? You see this kind of line here, this thing, just, just some different notation, okay? Just some different notation. Now, what is the range? The range, also called the image, these things are the same thing, just different names for the same thing, is, no, so codomain is not range. So there's a question now, codomain is not range? No, the codomain is not necessarily the range. For an onto function that I hope we'll get to in a minute, the codomain is the range, okay? So the range are all of the y's in the codomain, such that you can get to them, such that you can get to them, okay? That's the range. So the range is a subset of the codomain. Sometimes it's equal, sometimes it's a proper subset. Let's see, let's just see the examples and we'll immediately go to the function f of x equals x squared. Okay, I mean, you've been dealing with this function since you reached puberty, okay? F of x equals, oh, which is a long one back. F of x equals x squared. F of x equals x squared. Now, this is not really the definition of the function yet. Soon when you get to calculus, yeah, you'll just say f of x equals x squared is, is, and fine. But to be a bit more precise, I need to say f, I need to say f, from something, from my domain to the codomain. So let's choose a domain. I'll choose a domain to be the set of all real numbers, okay? I'll choose a domain to be the set of all real numbers. I'll now choose the codomain also to be the set of all real numbers, but I have a bit of choice here. I have a bit of choice. I could have, cho I could have chosen different things. So now, I don't want to do R plus, that's a good suggestion, but I just want to put, it's a function from the real numbers to the real numbers, okay? That's, that's, that's one way of, defini of defining this function, okay? So domain, codomain. What is the range? And the answers have already come. What is the range? Range equals just R plus, just the non-negative numbers. Okay, so R plus does not equal R, okay? All right, so in this case, the range is not the codomain. Now, I could have I could have said differently. I could have said, hey, hey, everybody, I'm defining the function to be from the set of real numbers to R plus. I could have put here an R plus. In this case, the domain would still be R plus, but it would equal the codomain. So it kind of, matters how you define the codomain, okay? Because sometimes the range will be the codomain, sometimes not, okay? I could have also, I could have also said that the function goes from R plus to R plus. 
The codomain is not a function. The codomain is a specification of the function, which is the second part of the relation, right? So the function is a binary relation. The function you could write as, as f y. That's it's a binary relation on x and y. Okay. Now I could have, I could have, if I wanted to, I could have put the function here to be like plus, you know, starting in R plus. Okay. So I'm restricting the x squared just to, just for positive numbers. I'm allowed to, I'm allowed to. In this case, the range would be restricted. Now we'll see in a second that our choices of what we do here affect if this function is one to one and on two, et cetera, and not. Okay, so you can draw a function with arrow diagrams. Now, of course, uh, this is like a relation between this set and this set. Of course, if you, you cannot do this for real functions like x squared, this is only functions on kind of finite domains and finite codomains, okay? Domain, coloring, codomain, all right? It's important for this to be a function that, let's see, I'm gonna add an arrow now and you'll tell me if, if now it's still a function. Is this still a function? Is this still a function? Well, I'll answer with the, with the arrow. But no, but I've got this now, both. So if I've got both of these arrows, it's not a function, okay? Now there was a, on the chat said, what is the range? Yes, yeah, so what, let's now forget this arrow. It was a bad idea. Um, is if I delete this arrow, sorry, if I delete this arrow, is this still a function? Is this a function if I delete this arrow? Is this relation a function? I deleted the arrow. No, because a function has to be defined for every element in its domain, okay? The codomain, ah, the codomain, you know, one in four, sorry guys, you didn't get lucky. So it was said before in the chat, what is the range? Say it again, what is the range of this function? Let's now delete all those scribbles. What's the range of this function? Two, three, and five, okay, that's the range. The range is not the codomain. All right. Now, time is very short. We've got eight minutes, um, and we're just going to touch the the key. Uh, what are those definitions? Do, 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 do. Sorry. Uh, inverse image. Because now I want to speak about the function being. Oh, okay, I see. Then what the uh, nodes do, then they go to real functions, which you'll deal more with later. So when, and we actually, this I'm skipping this because, but this is stuff you should know. So if you really have not done mathematics for a while, then for next week and the weeks to come, then, then read the examples of real functions section. Okay. So read this section because, you know, you're dealing with cosines and sines and you've done a bit of this in the homework, but just a bit more, uh, you know, Etc. Uh, now you can do compositional functions. We won't speak about this much, but basically, a compositional function is you when you apply a function onto a function, you do g of f of x. You write it like that. That's what you call a compositional functions. Okay, you can do compositions of functions. You can go and and read this more. Uh, well, just just spend spend just five minutes on this, uh, but that's. That's not, not a critical thing. I mean, compositional functions will happen a lot in, in calculus. But I want to get now to one to one to one and on to an inverse functions. Okay. So a function is one to one, and a different name for that is injective. If for all elements x1 and x2, if f of x1 equals f of x2, then x1 equals x2. Okay, so let me show you a function that's one to one. I'll do a function one to one. Now, don't don't jump out of your seat now. So just hold on, hold on. I'm going to write f of x equals x squared. Mm. Do f of x equals x squared. But I will say f is a function from r plus to r, for example. Okay, this, this, this is the definition of a function that's one-to-one. -one. Okay, let's draw it. Here's the x-axis. I just care about the positive values, there it goes. 
for every X in the domain, there is a unique Y in the range, okay? This one is one to one or injective. Yeah, I kind of cheated, I tricked you. I did F of X equals X squared, but I restricted the domain just to be the non-negative numbers. Now let's do a function that's not one to one, the most classic example of, no, so this is one, two, one. Let's do not one, two, one. So f of x equals x squared. And f is a function from r plus, sorry, just from r to r. The mechanism of the function is the same, but now I need to apply it to the domain, which is both the positive and the negative. Let's draw it. Oh, oh. This function is not one-to-one. -one. It's not one-to-one -one because if I take this point y, then it comes from both uh, square root of y and negative square root of y, okay? <coughs> so I've got two different x's. That's x, yeah, that's x1 and that's x2. I've got two different x's that put me on the same y. You see that slight subtlety of putting this plus or the, or, or the lack of change this thing from being one to one or not, okay? So the function is not one to one when we treat it with this domain. Okay, capish? Understand? We got four minutes. All right. Now there is a second, and there's a nice discussion on hash functions, etc. But no time for it. But you'll do that in a different course. The second property of a function is if it's onto, onto, and oops, onto, and that surjective, uh, onto is a synonym of surjective, okay? So I find the words injective and surjective more complicated than onto and one-to-one, -one. okay? You know what it means. So a function is onto, a function from the domain X to the codomain Y is onto, if for every little Y and Y, for every point in the codomain, there exists an X in the domain that the function covers it. Okay, let me show you of an example of a function that's on to. Don't jump on out of your seat. F of X is X squared again. And I'll define F to go from the reals to, what do I need to put here to make it on to? What do I need to put here? To make it on to. What do I need to put in the codomain? It'll go from the reals to be onto. So I want it, I want it, I want it all to be covered. What do I need to make? Put any ideas? What do I put here to make it onto? No. R plus. Yeah. So if I put it from the reals and I put this plus here, the R plus. Let's draw the function, the reals. It's not one-to-one, -one, but who cares? We're speaking about now onto, not about one-to-oneness, okay? It covers the codomain. I'm gonna draw now the codomain. Let me, let's do it in red, in, in red here, the codomain, and let's draw it in red line here. Here's a codomain. Every point of the codomain gets covered. Every point in the codomain gets, for every point in the codomain, for every Y, for all y in the codomain, there exists some x, in this case there exists two, but who cares, there exists some x, such that f of x equals y. So this is the onto version. Let's do a not onto version, not onto. Again, we'll stick with our boring, now it's very boring, the parabola, f of x equals x squared, but it gets a point across. What am I gonna do to make it not onto. What will I define as my codomain? Not onto. What will I define? R. In this case, you know, I try, I draw, I look, I think, and I say, okay, the codomain is R. And if I look at the codomain, only the stop bit is satisfied, is kind of happy because it has this, but the X, you can never get, get onto it. 
So that's not on two. Okay. So you've got the the one to oneness. You know, is one property. One to one means that you don't get to a point in the codomain twice, and on, or more than twice, more than once. And a co and on to means that you must get to every point exactly once. So finally, we get to the nice functions, a one to one correspondence or a bijection, and we spoke about that when we spoke about the cardinality of the. Uh, of the uh, reals, but only loosely, okay? But a one-to-one -one or a bijection is a function that's both one-to-one -one and onto, okay? So in the case of the square root, in the case of the square function, I can do, for example, f of x, where f is from r plus to r plus, that is the, or I'll turn it, I could go to minus, this one, just when I look at it, this one, this one is both for every point, it's one to one because for every point here, there's only a unique point here, and it's on to because for every point here, there is a point there. Okay, so it's important to do that. These functions have an inverse function, otherwise, they do not have an inverse function. Okay, we don't we don't have time to, to deal with that more, but but the idea should be clear because. The function is called an inverse. The inverse function is a function where you just say, well, this is now going to be the uh, domain and this will be the codomain. Okay. But if I, if it's not both one to one and on to, it cannot have an inverse. Let's see. Let's try here. Um, let's do, let's look at this version here. Uh, this version here is one to one. Is this, ver is this one here onto? Is this function, we're finishing in a second, we'll hang on in there. Is this function onto? Is this function onto the way I defined it? Again, the definition is not just in the mechanics of the function, it's also in the domain and codomain. It's not onto, right? It's not onto because these poor points, because I didn't put a plus here, right? So these poor points here, they don't have a anywhere to go. So I cannot define an inverse function. I cannot define based on this function, a function that goes from anywhere here back to here. Okay. Now, <coughs> this function here, uh, which one? Um, where is not the not one to one? Um, yeah, this function here, it's not one to one. So I can also not define an inverse function. But if it's both one to one and on to, like this one, then sure, I can define an inverse function. What's the inverse function, by the way? What's the inverse function? So the inverse, let's just say it and then finish. Inverse of this guy. Yeah, so we'll say f of x, very good, is square root of x. And f is again going from r plus to r plus. Okay, and it looks like this. It just looks like this thing where you flip the paper. The way to do the inverse is to draw it on the paper and then flip the paper. But if I flip the iPad, it's not gonna work. It's only gonna change what's happening on your screen. All right, that finishes all uh, I pretty much wanted to say here. There's just a bit more on functions in, in two dimensions, uh, but these are things you can pick up later when you get to the uh, continuation of the course. So next week, you're going to start with Tim uh, sequences, uh, their limits and series, and you'll get to functions right after that uh, within a week, uh, and they'll be real functions. And at this point, the course is now moving into the calculus part. Are there any questions? So that's what, that's what you'll start next week. No, very, very quiet, very, very tired, fair enough. Uh, thanks for hanging in there. I know it's probably a long day. Uh, some of you had uh, quite a lot, some are alive, that's good. I see alive, good. Stay alive, um, enjoy the work and have a good evening or afternoon. Okay, so you'll see Tim next week. Uh, come to my visit hours if you want. They're tomorrow, Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Take care. By the, oh, and uh, class, if I don't see you, so when you, those that are, that are in Brisbane, 
when times are a bit better and COVID, stop by my door if you want, just say a quick hi. I'm mostly not in the office these days, but that will change. And uh, those, when you come to Brisbane, uh, those that are overseas, uh, which is typically a nice place, it's just raining a lot these days. Uh, but when you come to Brisbane, then uh, say hi as well. Okay, uh, keep in touch. Bye.